Chancellor, Provost and Deputy Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests and graduates, as public orator, may I, Professor Turi King, present Professor Alice Roberts, a candidate for an honorary degree. Alice Roberts is an anthropologist, biologist, broadcaster, author, and one of the foremost science communicators of our age. More recently, she's been branching out into children's fiction, as well as developing a burgeoning career as a talented artist. Described variously in news articles as an anatomy goddess, a female Indiana Jones, a true Renaissance woman, there are many of us who suspect that there is very little that Alice couldn't turn her hand to and be a tremendous success at. Alice was born in Bristol and remembers always being interested in biology. Her interest was strengthened after being given her first microscope, with Alice becoming fascinated by the detail in nature's structures, everything from bees' wings to the creatures in pond water. Like many of us, the television documentaries of our own David Attenborough had a huge influence on her, and she also remembers finding small pottery sherds in the garden when she dug the vegetable patch. Such the seeds were grown for her future career at the nexus between science and history. Hints as to Alice's artistic talent came in 1988, when she won the Blue Peter competition for the cover of the 30th birthday of the Radio Times, which led to Alice herself also appearing on its cover. I know this early achievement comes back to haunt her from time to time on social media, as people occasionally discovered again when looking back through Blue Peter annuals. Alice first trained to be a doctor, studying medicine at the University of Wales College of Medicine, graduating with her medical degree and an intercalated Bachelor of Science degree in anatomy. She went on to work as a junior doctor in the NHS before being drawn into an academic career teaching clinical anatomy at the University of Bristol. What started as a six-month post turned into 11 years, and it was at this time, continuing her fascination in both human biology and history, which, as she quite rightly says, are intertwined, that she also completed a PhD in paleopathology researching human origins and disease in human bones. It was her study of archaeological bone that first brought her to the attention of the public as the bone specialist on Time Team for many years, starting in 2001. In 2005, she started to co-present Coast as the anthropology and geology specialist, and in 2009, she presented her first solo series for the BBC, The Incredible Human Journey. While many universities are now well aware of the tremendous reputational benefits of having their very own star academic science communicator and support them, Alice was one of the trailblazers in this arena. As such, without that support, Alice found it difficult to continue trying to balance teaching, research, and public engagement, of which television was becoming a prominent part. Alice therefore left Bristol, going freelance, and becoming director of anatomy at the NHS Severn Deanery School of Surgery, while also going on to present further television documentaries on a great range of topics, including medicine, archaeology, anatomy, and history. She now has well over 100 documentaries under her belt. Bristol's loss was the University of Birmingham's gain, when in 2012 she was appointed as their first professor of public engagement in science. As she said, she's pleased that we're now getting to the point in universities where public engagement isn't just seen as something you do at the weekend or in the evenings and isn't a distraction, but is actually built in and is an expected part of your job. Among her, other accomplishments, oh, sorry, among her other accomplishments, which are frankly too numerous to mention them all, she has written 15 popular science books, has been on the advisory board for science festivals as well as the prestigious Milner Center for Evolution. She has presented the highly esteemed BBC Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, a mainstay of the BBC Christmas television programming, and was awarded the Royal Society's first ever David Attenborough Award and Lecture. As well as having been president of the Humanists UK, she also chaired the live weekly independent SAGE briefings, streaming online during the pandemic, sharing up-to-the-minute facts, figures, and science advice to the public. It is Alice's Digging for Britain television series now in its 11th year, where the majority of Alice's involvement with the University of Leicester has been, in particular with ULAS, the University of Leicester Archaeological Services, 
and the School of Archaeology and Ancient History, highlighting many instances of their work on the program. The university first featured on Series 2 of Digging for Britain way back in 2011, when Alice and the film crew came to Burrow Hill, an Iron Age fort, where the student training excavation had just started. John Thomas of ULAS recounts that there was some competition from the very modern hill fort residents in the form of some very noisy sheep who were constantly interrupting and annoying the sound crew. Since then, the university has featured on the program numerous times. I particularly remember Alice tweeting cryptically that she was filming on the site of an amazing new archaeological discovery but couldn't say any more at the time. She had, in fact, joined the university team to help uncover the incredible Rutland Villa and Trojan War Mosaic near Oakham in 2021-2022, a site described as one of the greatest archaeological finds ever in this country. Alongside the assignment, the team at ULAS recall a particular moment which shows Alice's natural kindness. While waiting for more mosaic to be exposed, unscripted and natural, Alice gave an impromptu human bone session for some of the students, something which no doubt was one of the highlights of their time here. ULAS also features in the current series of Digging for Britain with the Leicester Cathedral project led by Matthew Morris, the very same archaeologist who found King Richard III and who has now revealed a hitherto unknown Roman shrine underneath the cathedral. Alice is a passionate advocate for the public understanding of science and the importance of scientific literacy for all of us, something which, if we've learned anything in the last four years, has been at times all too lacking. At a time when we desperately are in need of experts who can explain the science behind complicated subjects and provide a calm, rational voice in the face of widespread misinformation, talented science communicators are more important than ever. And Alice Roberts is among the best. Beyond her very many professional accomplishments, Alice is known for her strong support for women and diversity in science and her warm heart, championing reason, compassion, and empathy. It is her firm belief that kindness and love are what make this world a better place. Today, we celebrate Alice's towering achievements. She is truly one of our country's national treasures. Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Council in the Senate, I present Alice Roberts, that you may confer upon her the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Oh my goodness, it's so wonderful to be here among you today. Thank you very much, Professor King. Thank you, Dame Adarin Pocock. And thank you all for having me here. Um, it is a great, great honor to be amongst you today on a day which is uh, incredibly celebratory. I hope you're all incredibly happy and incredibly proud of what you've achieved to be here today. And it's wonderful to see so many family as well, here to support you and here to realize that achievement with you. We're all here dressed in thoroughly medieval garb. It's wonderful. I love the way that we get dressed for these occasions. We, it helps us memorialize it. It is very medieval. For those of you that are graduating in archaeology and heritage today, it's very fitting indeed, but the rest of you are allowed to enjoy it as well. It's a physical representation of all this hard work. I mean, the, the hard work that you've put in over these years to get to where you are today. And this is helping you to memorialize it, to remember it. We've all got hats as well. You will get a piece of paper like me, and all of that hard work is distilled into that piece of paper. But also, of course, it's there inside you, inside your brain as well. So we've got these tangible reminders of what is important about today, but I want to introduce you to an intangible idea. So if you'll humor me for just a moment while I'm talking, I want you to imagine that as well as wearing your medieval gowns and you've got your hats to put on later and that piece of paper, I want you to imagine that you've got a torch in your hand today, not an electric torch, not one of those, in case that's the first thing that leaps into your mind, or your mobile phone with the torch switched on, no, no, no an Indiana Jones-style torch. 
So it's going to be a big stick, it's going to be a blade, it's absolutely flaming. And you've got that there today. I want you to imagine that you're holding this bright, bright torch in your hand, and that represents your incredible achievement and your degree today, and you have kept that torch burning, but think about the people who have helped you to light that torch and make it burn more brightly. Think about the teachers that you've met over this journey, your tutors at the university, but also your family who have supported you through it, and your friends. And it's wonderful as everybody comes up to the stage to hear this incredible welling up of friendship and admiration and support from the audience. More of it, please. More of it from the families. Let's have some more from the, from the balcony up there in the second half. Yes! It's a wonderful celebratory day. So in your mind, I want you to imagine that you've got that torch. Let's leave that intangible image there for a second. You, you're holding it in your mind while I carry on for a moment. I want to talk about some tangible experiences that Turi has already just hinted at or mentioned, because I've had some absolutely incredible, really memorable experiences with, with colleagues who are here today on the stage coming to visit University of Leicester archaeological sites as they're progressing, Seeing the archaeology actually emerging out of the ground is one of my favorite things. There's these moments of discovery when suddenly you see something which has been hidden, sometimes for centuries, sometimes even for millennia, and you get that incredible moment of contact with somebody who lived many, many generations ago and ideas traveling through time. So about this time last year, I was visiting Leicester, and Matthew Morris was running the dig next to the cathedral, the cathedral, of course, that now holds the human remains of Richard III himself, emerging from, again, a University of Leicester dig, and with Professor Turi King doing the genetics on those human remains that proved that this was indeed the king. Next to the cathedral, Matthew Morris was excavating down and getting down to Roman layers. And because of work done by the University of Leicester, we perhaps have the best idea about any Roman town in Britain from the work that has been done here in Leicester. We really can imagine what it would have been like to live in Leicester uh, more than 16 centuries ago. And they'd got down to these Roman levels, and I had one of those phone calls where a producer rings me up and goes, I don't know what you're doing next week, but is there any possibility you can just come up to Leicester and see what they're finding? I said, what are they finding? something Roman and it's really exciting. So I, so I jumped on the train and came up to Leicester. And what Matthew and his team had found was a, was a subterranean room, a kind of cellar, and in that cellar there was an altar. So it was a Roman altar, probably a Roman shrine. Now we can't draw a direct connection between that shrine and the cathedral, but there's still a wonderful synergy between those two points in time. And the tangibility of it through the archaeology is what really fascinates me. Then, as Tori said, I was in this field in Rutland uh, as the wheat was being harvested and then as the excavation progressed. And I was able to actually get involved in that excavation myself. And it's something I will never forget. I will never forget it. Troweling back and then brushing very, very carefully as tiny little square stones started to appear of this absolutely extraordinary mosaic. It was beautiful. Our foremost mosaic expert in Britain said it's the best mosaic find for at least 100 years. It was utterly unbelievable to be there at the moment that it was uncovered. And what was extraordinary about this mosaic is that a lot of Roman mosaics are patterns, beautiful patterns. Sometimes we have animals on them, sometimes dolphins, um, sometimes a Roman deity appears. But this mosaic had a whole story. It had three panels. In the first panel were two warriors fighting each other in chariots. In the second panel, one of the warriors had killed the other and was dragging his body behind the chariot. And then there was another person who'd wandered into this scene who was pleading with the surviving warrior for the dead body of the deceased one. And then in the third panel, we saw again the dead body and the, and the king, because he was a king, paying for that dead body in gold. And that story is a story that I knew, 
And I thought, this is absolutely extraordinary. This is extraordinary to see a story that was created in this stone floor probably 1,600 years ago. And I know what it says. I know what this story means because this is the warriors are Achilles and Hector. The king is Priam. This is a, these are scenes from the Iliad. This is a scene from a story that was already centuries, if not millennia old, by the time it was created in that stone pavement in a field in Rutland. This is what we do as humans. We take ideas and we pass them on through the generations. Sometimes we do it face to face. Sometimes we do it through putting our thoughts down and people can either see them in the form of a mosaic pavement or read them or watch videos, perhaps even centuries later. And so we have these ideas building and building and building. And this is how we build upon the knowledge of previous generations and we gradually increase it and increase it. And of course, this is what universities are for. This is what they're designed to do. They're designed for that knowledge to be passed on. They're designed to nurture an environment where you can come and you can benefit and you can absorb that knowledge and those skills and those experiences, all sorts of life skills as well as the subject-specific skills um, and knowledge that you've been learning. And now you're at this moment where you've benefited from all of that and also you've created your own ideas, you've put those ideas that you've learnt together with something which is uniquely you, and you're at a moment now where you've finished one chapter in your life and you're about to head on to another one. And it is right to mark it and memorialize it and to be proud of what you've done to get here and to think of all of those that have supported you on the way. But of course, it doesn't stop here. You're not just going to walk away and put that on a shelf and forget about all of this because it's now part of you, it's in you. That knowledge, those skills, those experiences, you will take and you will put them into practice in the next chapter of your life. And not only that, you will pass them on, because it's what we do as humans. You can't help doing it. You won't just keep them selfishly to yourself. You'll pass on those ideas, the knowledge that you continue to gain, the skills that you will hone, your experiences. And this is a fundamental part of what it is to be human. It is perhaps the most joyful experience that we have as humans. So going back to the torch then, you've got that torch in your hand. You've kept it burning. Well done. It's an immense achievement to be here today after all those years of hard work. And everybody around you that's helped you keep that light alive. But now you're going to be taking that torch out with you and there are more torches to be lit. You are now the torchbearers. And thank you. <laughs>